I love working with patterns by Jane Hardy Miller because she is so precise in her work and the instructions are so perfectly clear. This particular quilt is called Corrugated Quilt and uh, it was actually made by Jane Hardy Miller. This is not one that I made. But I love this quilt and I love that I get to have it in the studio. Today we're going to be working with another pattern called Blank Slate and it was created by both Jane Hardy Miller and Patricia Ritter. This is the quilt called Blank Slate and it was created by Patricia Ritter and Jane Hardy Miller. Um, it is a copyrighted pattern so I'm not really going to be going over the instructions on how to make it but I do want to show you how uh, versatile the quilt is. The original pattern was created in a black and white and gray color palette. I'll show you a close-up of that in a second. But the nice thing about the quilt is that it has several spots on which you could do uh, embroidery or hand applique. Uh, in our case today we're going to be using it for some laser cut applique that's already pre-fused. Um, as you can see I used snowflake fabric uh, as my foundation for the quilt so that lets you know that this is going to be a Christmassy type quilt which is my favorite um, if you don't know by now uh, but I'm going to be using one of our new patterns of a laser cut applique and it's part of the uh, gnome gnome sweet home gnome uh, grouping I already did this colorway on this uh, bag that I got from Joann's this is the uh, retro dots and we have the both patterns the single and the triple available in both batik and the retro dots today I'm going to be using the batik so let me pull the camera in so you can see what some of the uh, pattern pages look like just to give you an idea of how well the uh, pattern is constructed and um, there's also some samples in there of how you can do your own applique on here uh, just give you some ideas so let's move the camera this is the uh, front cover page of the blank slate as I said is created by Jane Hardy Miller and Patricia Ritter it is a copyrighted pattern um, but on the cover you can see we have one example of the laser cut applique here and this is probably the kind of positioning that I'm going to be using uh, for my gnomes today. But the pattern is very, very well done. Gives you step-by-step -step cutting and pressing and sewing instructions. So it goes together really quickly. And it seems like a lot of pages for a simple quilt, but that's because it's so well uh, detailed. But these are the pages that I also wanted you to see. We have uh, this pattern here with the large sun sunbursts on them. Um, that I've already done this quilt once, um, but this would be another pattern where they would really be a very effective on the quilt. We also have some of these scooters and uh, campers on there, the love bug, the love bus. Um, I mean, you could do safari animals, you could do monkeys, uh, all kinds of different applique that you could put on here that would really make it stand out. One of the large snowmen, reindeer games, uh, hallelujah, um, one of the baby goats or the mama goats could be really cute on this quilt. So the quilt has a lot of possibilities. It's also a really great quilt as it is if you wanted a very modern quilt for a dorm room or for somebody who was into minimalism. It gives you just a little bit of punch of color with a few strips of fabric um, that are required to make it and um, you know it goes together really quickly. Um, having said that I always feel like I'm a little rushed each week uh, trying to produce a new video for you each week. So um, I started this yesterday for a couple hours and I finished it this morning in a couple hours. Um, I did make a mistake, but that was because I wasn't paying attention. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and lay my paper out uh, for the gnome applique and see exactly where I want to get it positioned. 
and I'll also get my light box set up and we'll be back probably after I lay out all of my pieces uh, now I think I'm going to position the paper first and then I'll lay out my applique pieces this particular applique uh, which I'm in love with is the gnome for the holidays and it does have lettering included with this kit and I am going to use the lettering and because of the limitations of where that could really go I'm going to go ahead and put that in here first before I even put my applique on uh, of my gnomes and you can see that it's just a little bit tight on the lettering and so I'm going to lay the lettering out and see if I can't just scrunch them together just enough to get all of this lettering right in between my two uh, snowflake fabric pieces. Um, I have it fairly well leveled out so I'm going to go ahead and get those into position and um, then I'll go ahead and worry about moving up to the gnomes. But I'm just in love with this. Um, it's so cheerful and I hope I've done a pretty good job of matching the applique fabric with my fabric from my stash. Um, the problem with batiks, they have no selvage. So I'm not sure what the name of these snowflake fabrics were or who manufactured them. Um, so I did pull them out of my stash and I was happy to find them. So I'm going to go ahead and put my letters on and then we'll uh, go ahead and peel, place, and press. I always like to lay out my pieces before I get started, especially with a kit like this because there are so many small pieces in here. I mean, you can see here, this is one of the little bird beaks and that's quite small. So I just like to lay everything out to make sure everything's in its place and then go ahead and pre-position it. But you really want to pay attention because you can see some of these pieces are very similar. And if you're not a great speller like me to begin with, you really want to pay attention to the outlines to make sure that you have these all in place, in the right place. They will fit exactly where the pattern says they should. And these are very easy to do. Um, all you have to do is peel, place, and press. The laser cut applique has really sharp, crisp edges. And you just peel the paper off of the back and position this in place. The Steema Seam 2 uh, is tacky to the touch. So um, that will stay in place even if I have to move the quilt top. And um, it's not permanent until you iron it. And that gives you a chance to stand back and make sure that everything is exactly as you want it when you're putting these on. And you can see here, the paper really does come off quite easily. If you ever have an issue with the paper sticking, you can always take a needle or a seam ripper and just score the back of an applique shape right through the paper. And that gives you something uh, to bend and lift up the applique shape with. So it's really fairly easy to get these papers off of the back of the quilt. So in just a few seconds, really, I've already got the lettering for Gnome down. But I'm gonna go ahead and continue working across to get my lettering in place. I don't know that you necessarily want to sit there and watch me do all of that. But when I get over to this word here where it kind of goes up onto my fabric a little bit, because keep in mind this pattern was not designed specifically for this applique, it just lends itself to it. I'm just gonna scrunch the word over about a quarter of an inch, which should allow me to get my uh, letter E in there without it rubbing into the end of the uh, fabric because I do want it to pop out. So because it's the E I'm worried about, I'm going to put the E down first and then work my way backwards. I'm just using the bottom and top of the letter to keep it in 
uh, line with the rest of the lettering on this uh, applique and that way I know that when it's finished it's not going to be really out of place. So that is uh, the top line. I'm going to go ahead and do the bottom line and then we'll move up. As you can see I have all of my lettering in place. I really just used the heat of my hand to set those pieces in place and you can see even if I move the quilt now they're not going to come off of there. Now if I needed to reposition them for any reason they are still uh, able to come up off of the fabric. They're not fused permanently yet. Uh, but for me right now they're where I want them to be and now I'm going to try and position my gnomes and see where they're going to work best. This is approximately the field in which I want my gnomes to show up. And I keep touching my off button. So I already have my lettering done so I don't have to worry about that. Um, I kind of wanted a little bit of his center gnome's cap to come up on this blue square and I'm not real sure how the uh, leaves are going to show up on my dark fabric um, but I'm going to go forge ahead so I think this is about the level uh, height wise that I want it and just about the level width wise that I want it as well um, if I wanted to bring these in a little bit I could raise the center gnome up a little bit which would allow me to slide the other two over but I think I'm going to go ahead and keep it pretty much the way it is so I'm going to position that under the fabric and then I'm going to start spreading out all of my pieces for the applique to make sure they're close by and then we'll get to the next step of peeling those papers off. All of our applique patterns come with a really nice instruction sheet to tell you the process of using the applique uh, at your home. So all of our instructions always have that. But as you can see, I've generally laid out most of the larger components for the applique. Anywhere where there's a dotted line, that means that that shape goes up underneath or goes down first um, to create the image that we're trying to create. So I'm going to just go ahead and start putting down some of these pieces and just to show you what the gnomes will look like. I think I'm going to try and get one complete gnome done. The black fabric always feels a little bit thicker to me than um, some of the other pieces. I don't know if it's just a really nice thick cotton or if it's a different type of material. But you can see just how quickly in real time that this goes together. These little cuffs do have a slight little curve to them so I do like to try and make sure I get those in the right position when I'm putting them on. And all of these pieces I'm putting down are pieces that are behind the dotted line. They go down underneath something else. So and if I ever have a question I can always refer to the um, let's see I think I should put my face down first refer to the color instruction sheet there I like the way that looks better and see how the blue is sticking out here I don't know if the nose is going to cover all of that yes it does 
So if it didn't, I would go ahead and slip that underneath the face if I was confused about the uh, way in which those went on. But I can see with that, well, I'm, not, I'm still not happy with that. So I'm going to lift both of these back up and put the face to the front. And then I can put these pieces down. And I'm a little bit happier with the way that that goes. So basically, you can see this is just how quick the gnomes go together. And I have all of those, so the next would be just seeing, and you know, I can also play with the um, leaves to see which one shows up on better, and then move some of the other ones around. And also, I'm going to be doing the same with my uh, flowers. So I'm going to see which one pops on that background, and then I'll use the other ones where it's on the white background, just to make sure that they pop enough on the fabric that I chose. So I'm going to go ahead and keep moving on that and I'm going to get some more of these gnomes in place and we'll bring you back in to show you how it's progressing. As you can see I have my three gnomes in place and I have one of my birds in place and the stem for my flower. I'm going to go ahead and do this next bird because I can clearly see where he goes. And it's always nice to look up underneath at the dotted line to see how high that uh, stalky legs are meant to go. Because the legs are all the same size, but they don't all appear on the pattern as the same size. So sometimes there's more tucked underneath another component than others. like a little bit of space in between just so you can clearly see the distinction. I also like to get my beak down first because it's such a little piece and when I put my beak down I always start at the very point. It seems to help me get it into place a little bit better. The paper backing on this uh, laser cut applique peels off so beautifully. Now I probably shouldn't have said that till I'm finished because isn't that just the way. But generally I don't even have to use a needle or anything to score the back. And I may have said this before with these um, eyes. These eyes are like ultra suede and it is a thicker material so you do have to make sure when you're fusing that that you give it plenty of time to fuse properly. Now as you can see some of the components for some of the other pieces yet to come are a little bit harder to see so instead of having my pattern underneath I'm going to bring the pattern out and move it to the top and once I know where a piece is going, then I'll just lift the paper up and slide it in. The light box is a great way to see through, but sometimes you just have so many layers of applique in these compound pieces that you can't see anymore where something goes. So I'm going to go ahead and move my pattern out, and then I can move on to the next uh, phase here. And now you can see a little bit better where the uh, pieces are going to go. Use my light just long enough to get that line back up again. And then I can shut that off. So I just have the flower and the stem. These flowers here, let's see which ones we're going to go with. 
I want light ones on here so they will show up on that darker piece. But I always have to place these ahead of time because they always trick me which way they go. And that's not really on there. This one I think has to be the light one. So I'm going to put that one there. And maybe this one over here. So I'll just slide that over. If these uh, pieces weren't exactly where they were supposed to go, as long as they're on top of the flower stem, I'm okay with that. I do like to get it as close to the pattern as possible, but these always, this particular flower always gets me. That, that paper peeled off just by my by me lifting it up. So you can see how easily they come off sometimes. And let's just see. This one little tip matches down here. I think that's going to be okay. It's kind of a medium on a dark, but I still think that shows up good. With all of these points, I always like to be really careful because it would be easy to blunt one of these tips and I really don't want that for my pattern. So now I have this one in place. I have my bird done and I just think I'm going to lift. These aren't quite touching the way I would like so I'm just going to lift the whole thing up as a component and put it back down. And that's what's so nice about the Steam of Seam 2, is it gives you a little bit of time to play until you fuse something uh, in place. Now let's see. I'm going to go ahead and use this one here. That, that direction. Save these. Oh, here they are. I always think I've got these in the right place, and then I find out that I do not. It's just a very, there we go, very subtle shape difference. And I should have one more. So I'm going to go ahead and just do a sort of a guesstimate about where this flower goes. Then we put our circles in for these, the center of our flower. slightly off-center and then just looking at the position of this leaf I can go ahead and put these in place and again I'm just being careful not to smash my edges so I keep really crisp applique shapes And I don't know about you, but I'm really enjoying the beautiful spring weather we're having. 
it's probably about 50 or 60 degrees here today which is lovely and the sun is out which really makes um, for a beautiful day there we have that in place now we're down to the last little bit of flowers which are going to be over here um, I think that's going to show up really well on here which is what I wanted for that to really pop on the background just about down to the last three or four pieces for a completed project and I got lucky I got a bonus flower one two three it doesn't have the flower centers but I'm gonna save that in my little stash box in case I ever need uh, another flower somewhere it's just like the samples that we used to give out at the quilt shows we always used to bring hundreds and hundreds of those little samples with our business card and we would always run out but it was always something it was always so fun to show those to the people at Quilt Market and Quilt Festival. So now I have all of my components done. Everything's in place. Uh, it's just temporarily fused. So I'm going to go ahead and move the pattern away, move all of my little pieces of paper away, and get my iron out and my light box out of the way, and we'll move on to the pressing. After I get all of my pieces in place, I always like to sit back and just look at it to make sure that I'm happy with everything and the way that the uh, fabric is layered and positioned. If I need to make any little adjustments, now would be the time to do that. Um, That was just bothering me a little bit. But um, it's easy to make little adjustments now because the stuff is only uh, positioned. It's not permanently fused. But when I'm ready to fuse it, what I like to do is um, use a water source. I don't usually put water in my iron just because uh, you put water in the iron and the iron starts leaking. If I never put water in the iron, the iron never leaks. So I'm just using a spray bottle and I'm just misting the top of my uh, applique components. And then I'm gonna lay over top of it an applique pressing sheet. And I like to do this for a lot of reasons. Uh, prevents anything from transferring from the iron to the fabric. Also, if I'm sliding the iron back and forth, which I do sometimes because I'm lazy, the edge of the iron doesn't catch the edge of an applique and crinkle it up and then fuse it in place without me knowing it and then I have a crinkled piece of applique that I'm not very happy with um, but also I can just go ahead I've got the moisture down there on the pieces and I can just rotate the iron around until I get all of the pieces uh, completely fused once I have all of those fused then I will flip the whole quilt top over and I will fuse it again from the other side just to make sure that the heat has had time to transfer through the entire uh, multi-layer applique shape. Now I'm moving the iron too fast. It really should be like 15 to 20 seconds in each position. But I just like to go across it quick while we're talking. I'm going to go ahead and fuse this properly um, off camera just to make sure that I get each component fused nice and well in place. 
Also, I like to apply a little bit of pressure just to make sure that when the fusima material is uh, melting, that you get a really tight bind, bound, uh, bond, that's the word, a really tight bond to the fabric. So you have really nice crisp applique. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue this out and I'll show you what it looks like when we're finished. Well, I'm gonna call this a wrap on this project. The name of the quilt pattern is called Blank Slate. It is available on the Urban Elements website. And the name of the applique that I used today was called Gnome for the Holidays. And that comes with the three gnomes and the lettering down at the bottom. Uh, it has all of the laser cut applique and uh, they're all pre-fused with steam and seam too, so it's just peel, place, and press. But this particular quilt really uh, lends itself to having all different kinds of things that you could have applique on there. Uh, use any type of fabric. I used a seasonal Christmas fabric for mine, uh, which I really like with the gnomes. But you could have really used uh, any, any kind of fabric that you choose. And I just want to thank you for stopping in today and welcoming us into your home. So we'll see you next time. And in the meantime, I'll be scrambling on what's going to be next week. Home for the holiday. Known for the holidays. I'll be home for the holidays. <laughs>